So here we're looking at section 1.3 on functions and relations. So the concepts that we're going to look at here are determine whether a relation is a function. So we're going to talk about what a relation is. Uh, we're also going to talk about function notation, x and y intercepts, domain and range, and uh, eh, we may not look at interpreting a function graphically, but we may. So we need to define a few things. Okay. The first thing is a relation. Okay. A relation is basically just a set of ordered pairs. Okay, so if we have a set of ordered pairs, that's a relation. We we'll call the ordered pairs oops, x and y. Well, x and y. Then that means that we have uh, a relation in x and y. Okay, now a domain. Uh, when we talk about a relation, the domain is just the set of all x values. And the range is just the set of all y values. Now, this is going to look, th this is an important term right here. Okay, set. When we talk about sets, we're going to be using something called set notation. Sets are always denoted by braces. Okay? So if we're talking about a set of ordered pairs, then like 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and then put them all in braces. So notice that the ordered pairs themselves are separated by commas, but the entire set of them is in braces. Now the set of all of the x values here, or the domain of this relation, would just be braces and then the, the 0, the 2, and the 5. These are not ordered pairs. There's no parentheses, no reason to have them. It's just braces. The y values 1, 3, and 8. Okay. Now, a relation is a set of ordered pairs. The x values are all called the domain. The y values are all called the range. Now, a function is a special type of relation uh, where if you have uh, a value in the domain, okay, so every value in the domain, let's we'll say for every value in the domain, there is only one value. in the range. So what are we talking about? Notice here, x is 0. It goes or corresponds with the y value 1. 2 corresponds to the y value of 3. 5 corresponds to the y value of 8. Okay, so 0 only goes to one number, 1. 2 only goes to one number, 3. 5 only goes to one number, 8. Okay. How can I keep this from being a function? Well, what if I have another where 2 goes to 5? But here 2 went to 3. Then we can't do that. So when we're talking about relations, we're basically going to say if the x value is repeated, then it's not a function. Okay? Not a function. So to be a function, none of the x values can be repeated. So let's look at this. We've got a table here. We've got a table of x values. These are all of your x values here. And these are all your y values. So we want to write the set of ordered pairs that defines this relation. Okay? So, we're talking about the x and y, so 3 and negative 4. We're talking about negative 2 and 0. We're talking about 5 and 3. And we're talking about 1 and 0. Now remember, this is a set, so we've got to make sure and put our answer in braces. 
So now we want to write the domain. Also a set, just the x values. 3, negative 2, 5, and 1. Write the range. This is just the y values. Negative 4, 0, 3, and 0. But I've already got 0, so I don't have to write that twice. Okay. All right, so let's look at some actual problems here. Here we want to start by asking ourselves, is this a function? Okay. We know we can look at it and see the domain and range. What we want to know is, is this a function? So basically, since this is set up as relations, all we have to do is look at the x value. 2, 2, 3. Is the x value repeated? Yes. So not a function. Here we've got 1, 2, 3. Is x value repeated? No. So function. So it's easy to see when we have these uh, relations that are defined as a set of ordered pairs. But what if we have a relation that looks a little different? What if we have a relation like this? Well, we can always write this as a set of ordered pairs, right? We can see that this negative 2 is going to this negative 2. So negative 2, negative 2. 6 is going to 6. Pi is going to pi. So are any of the x values repeated? No. So that's a function. But there's an easier way. If we're looking at a pictorial representation like this, as long as there's only one arrow, one arrow per x means function. Because what would happen if I said here, all right, what if negative 2 is also going to 6? Then I would have to add that point, and I can see that my x value is repeated. So if there's only one line coming off of each x value, that's a function. All right, so my question here is, how do we determine if uh, we have a function when we don't have any coordinates when we don't have any um, when we don't have any um, ordered pairs. Okay, well, there's a real easy way to, to, to do this. Okay, if we as long as we def we're talking about defining y as a function of x, then if we've got y equals, okay, we've got y isolated, then as long as the function is not, well, I don't want to define it like that. I'm going to mathematically show you how to do it. What you're going to do is you're going to say, is there any, is there exactly one value of y for one value of x? So if I plug in a value for x, how many different y's do I get? So if I here, if I plug in x equals 0, I get 0 plus 6, I get 6. There's only one value. If I plug in 2, I get 2 times 2 is 4 plus 6 is 10. It's still just one value. It doesn't matter what the number is. I'm always only going to get one value out. Okay. So as long as y has no variables, not variables, sorry, exponents, then it's going to be a function. Because if I plug in a value for x, I'm just going to get a value out, one value. So the question is, well, when will I get more than one value? Well, what about this? Here I've got x equals 7 minus y. Here, notice y does not have an exponent. I can solve this for y. So for number 6, if I want to solve this for y, I'm going to add y to both sides. So I get y plus x equals 7. I'm going to subtract x. So I get y equals 7 minus x. So no matter what I put in, I've only got one y. Okay. So this is a function. Now let's look here at 7. 
So I've got x equals 7 minus y squared. So I'm going to add y squared. I get y squared plus x equals 7. Subtract x. I get y squared equals 7 minus x. Now if I want to get y by itself, I'm going to have to take the square root, right? But remember, when we take the square root, square root property tells us that we have to have plus or minus. Okay? So what we wind up with is y equals plus or minus 7 minus x, square root of 7 minus x. So this is two separate answers. If I plug in x equals 1, or say x equals 3, 7 minus 3 is 4, square root of 4 is 2, y equals plus or minus 2. That's two different y's for one x. So, not a function. So here's your tip. Even exponent on y means not a function. Because anytime I take the square root, the fourth root, the sixth root, I have to do plus or minus. Now number eight has an odd exponent. Odd exponents, just like this one up here, totally, totally okay. That's going to be a function. So even exponents, not a function. Odd exponents are functions. These are the exponents on y, right? That's important. Not only, but on y. So if we want to determine whether a relation is a function, we can do something called the vertical line test. And this works when we have a graph, okay? If we're graphing something. So the vertical line test tells us that if we can draw a vertical line on any portion of the graph and hit two points or more on the graph, not a function. Okay? Why? What does this mean? Why does that work? If I have, let's say I have a graph that looks like this. Okay? And I draw a vertical line, and notice it hits here, and it hits here. This line, this vertical line, a vertical line is given by y equals some number. Okay? That means that the y is always going to be the same. Regardless, I'm sorry, it's not y, x equals, it's a vertical line, x equals some number. The x will always be the same. The y will change. So x equals some number, let's say this is x equals 2. Then this is 2, 2, and this is 2, negative 2. Same x values, different y values. Okay, so that means that we have one x value with multiple y values. So, not a function. Okay, so let's look at a couple. Does this graph define y as a function of x? One, two places, new. No. Okay, what about this? Is there anywhere I can draw a vertical line and hit more than one point on the graph? No, so this is a function. What about this one? This one looks like it's a function, but looky here. Notice at this point, that point, because these are both closed circles, that is hitting two different points. 
So be careful when we're talking about piecewise functions or functions that have a break in them because that's going to give us uh, not a function because it's going to have two different y values for one value of x. All right, so that gets us involved in uh, our uh, determining functions. So we want to talk about function notation now. We want to talk about from here on out, most of the time we're going to be dealing with functions, not just relations. Okay, so we want to talk about what is function notation and how do we uh, how do we deal with it? Okay, so here's something called function notation. I know we've all seen it. We're talking about f of x. That means that f is a function of x. f of x is just a fancy way of saying y. Okay, so when we talk about our equations. We're, we're just changing their y into f of x and just recognizing that it is a function. Okay. Now when we do function notation, we can evaluate f of anything by just taking that and whatever's in the parentheses. See here are the x's in parentheses, so we have x's. If I have negative 3, I'm just going to rewrite the equation, taking out the x's and plugging in negative 3's. So be careful here. Order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. We have to do exponents before we do multiplication. So negative 3 squared is positive 9. 9 times 2 is 18. Negative 3 times negative 3 is plus 9 plus 1. So 18 plus 9 is 27 plus 1 is 28. So that just tells us when x is equal to negative 3, y is equal to 28. So what about square root of 2? So we're going to say 2 square root of 2 squared minus 3 times the square root of 2 plus 1. Just changing the x into square root of 2. So the square root of 2 squared is just 2. 2 times 2 is 4 minus 3 square roots of 2 plus 1. So 4 plus 1 is 5 minus 3 square root of 2. And we're going to leave our answer like that because we're not asked to round or give us any kind of uh, approximation. What happens if we don't plug in a value? What happens if we plug in a variable? Well, that just means I'm changing x into whatever that variable is. So here I'm just changing x into a. So 2a squared minus 3a plus 1. And I'm done. There's really nothing I can do at that point, okay? So we've done numbers, we've done variables. What about an expression? It's really no different than it was before. We're just going to say, put our parentheses and just write the expression. The only problem here is now we've got a square. So that means we're going to have to foil out that. So that's 2 times 3 plus z times 3 plus z minus 3 times 3 plus z plus 1. So here we're going to fold this out. Remember, the 2 stays outside. We're going to go ahead and fold this. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times z is 3z. Plus another 3z is 6z. And then plus z squared. Here we're going to hippity hoppity distributive property. So we're going to hop through. Negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. Negative 3 times z is negative 3z. And then the plus 1. Now we can hippity hoppity this 2. We get 18 plus 12z plus 2z squared minus 9 minus 3z plus 1. And now we can combine all of our like terms. We only have 1z squared, so 2z squared. We've got a 12z minus 3z, which means positive 9z. And then we've got an 18 minus 9, which is 9, plus 1, which is 10. And that's awful to put that line right through there. Okay? So, with an expression, it can be a little more challenging because you've got that uh, square in there, so we're having to square it, but other than that, it's just like any of the other problems that we've done. Okay? Here, we've got another problem. We're going to evaluate all of these again. And we're just going to plug in the value for x. So 
this equals the square root of 6 minus 2 times 3 instead of x, which is square root of 6 minus 6, which is square root of 0, which is just 0. If we plug in 4, we get the square root of 6 minus 2 times 4 equals the square root of 6 minus 8, which is square root of negative 2, which is not real. If we plug in negative 4, we get square root of 6 minus 2 times negative 4, which is 6 plus 8, which is square root of 14. Square root of 14, of course, can't be broken down because it's only 7 and 2 that will go into it. Doing 2w, square root of 6 minus 2 times 2w. You're just plugging that in. So we get square root of 6 minus 4w. And because it's got a variable in it, that's all we can do. Okay? Now, this is leading us into uh, x and y intercepts. Okay? So we're going to talk about what an x-intercept is, what a y-intercept is. So the x-intercepts are the real solutions to the equation f of x equals 0. Okay? This just means that, we're going to put this in a bracket off to the side, this just means that our y value equals 0, right? Because f of x equals y. That's just another way of saying y. So x-intercepts occur when y equals 0. Now the y-intercept is given by the equation, or not the equation, but the uh, expression f of 0. Okay? So y equals f of 0. That just means f of, the of is the x, right? So that means x equals 0. So y-intercepts occur when x equals 0. And this is important. x-intercepts, y equals 0. y-intercepts, x equals 0. So what does this mean in terms of graphs? An x-intercept means we're crossing the x-axis. It's where it intercepts the x-axis. Well, we know that any point on the axis, if the x-axis has no up or down motion, that means that y equals 0. Same thing with a y. If it's crossing the y-axis, it has no left-right motion, so it has the x equals 0. Now, it's easy to see that if you graph it, but what if we're talking about equations? Well, remember, by definition, the x-intercept occurs when y equals 0, and the y-intercept occurs when x equals 0. So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as y equals x squared minus 4. So, if x equals 0, I get y equals 0 squared minus 4, or y equals negative 4. If y equals 0, then I get 0 equals x squared minus 4, add 4 to both sides, take the square root, I get x equals plus or minus 2. So my y-intercept is going to be 0, negative 4 because x equals 0. And remember, when we talk about x and y-intercepts, we're talking about points. Okay, so this is a, an ordered pair. It's got to have an x and a y value. But if it's got a y, that it means x is 0. Same thing over here. I'm given x values, so I've got 2 and my y value is 0 negative 2, 0. Now, if we're talking about something with a graph, it can have, you know, however many x-intercepts you want. However, to be a function, it can only have one y-intercept. Because if it has two y-intercepts, it would fail the vertical line test. Okay? So let's go down here to 3 minus the square root of x, or the absolute value of x, I'm sorry. Now, how do we solve this? Well, what happens if we let x be 0? 
then you get let's substitute y equal here again then we're going to have y equals 3 minus the absolute value of 0. Well, absolute value of 0 is just 0, so y equals 3. So that gives us the point 0, 3. Now, if I say y equals 0, then I get 0 equals 3 minus the absolute value of x. So I'm going to add the absolute value of x to both sides. So I get the absolute value of x equals 3. Well, I know that if I take the absolute value of 3, I get 3. But if I take the absolute value of negative 3, I also get 3. So here, x could be plus or minus 3. So we got 3, 0, and negative 3, 0. Now, when we do this one, y equals 2 minus the square root of x, if x equals 0, we get y equals 2 minus the square root of 0, which is just y equals 2. So 0, 2. But if I let y be 0, 2 minus the square root of x, then I'm going to add the square root of x to both sides. I get the square root of x equals 2. I want to get rid of this. I'm going to have to square both sides. And I get x equals 4. So I'm going to have the point 4, 0. Okay. You've got mail. Now, given the relation to finding y as a function of x, the blank is the set of all the x values in the function, and the blank is the set of all y values in the function. We should be able to deduce the, the, these first, because these words are up here, but also that's kind of what we did previously. The domain was all the x values, and the range was all of the y values. But before, we were talking about discrete values. There were two, five, seven. You know, it weren't uh, con they weren't continuous. Here we're talking about continuous functions. So, to do a continuous function, the domain is all of the x values. So we're going to put a little star here, and we're going to say x values. The range is all of the y values. So, to find them, we're going to have to talk about something called interval notation. Since these are continuous functions, it's going to be all the values from one point to another. So we need to find the smallest, let me do this, the smallest x value to the largest x value. And the same thing here, smallest y value to largest y value. So if I'm coming from the x direction, I'm talking about small, right? So I'm coming from the left side. What's the first x value I come to? Well, here it is. This is as far x as it comes. But this is an arrow, which means it's going forever up and to the left. So arrows, we're going to call them a different word now. When we're talking about domain and range, we're going to call them inferos because they go to infinity or negative infinity depending on what direction okay so here since we're they're going forever to the left that means that the smallest x value is negative infinity and then i'm going to draw and i'm going to keep going across what's the farthest right point or the largest point well i've got another arrow since i'm going to the right i'm going in the positive direction i'm going to have infinity now I know I'm going from negative infinity to positive infinity. The question is, well, I'm not going to ask that question yet. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the range. So let's start with the y value. We're going to go up. What's the first y value we come to? It's right here at positive 2. So the smallest value can be is 2. And if we could keep going up, the largest value, oh, we get an arrow. But we know that arrows mean infinity. Now here's the issue. I need to know how to enclose these. They're not sets per se, they're intervals. So for interval notation, we have to know are the endpoints of the interval included? Okay, so we're going to do either brackets which denote included, 
and these are either filled in circles or continuous a continuous point on our graph like here this was a continuous point on our graph so that means we're going to include that point so we get a bracket now parentheses means not included included and that will be an open circle or a break in our graph okay now if there's nothing there it's not included the circle means not included question is what is infinity infinity is not a number right infinity is a concept so infinity or I'm going to open a parenthesis or negative infinity always get parentheses because they are concepts not numbers it just means there's something bigger okay so I can't say it includes this point because there's still a point further on that it will get to so we'll always use parentheses on infinities all right so after talking about that let's look at this problem and say okay what's the domain in the range so we're gonna start at the left and come this way first thing we come to is an infero so that means negative infinity then we're gonna keep coming and notice here we have a gap our, our uh, function jumps so we've got to ask ourselves is there a break here is there a spot where something is not defined well the question is here it's an open circle but here it's a full circle so that means that it is still continuous along X okay so you could write it as we go from here to what value of x is this remember we're talking about x that's the x value of zero so it goes to zero and then we can say well here we have a new graph which starts at zero and where is it going it's coming this way and we get an arrow an infero which is going to infinity so we have two different intervals but here's the thing this one is not including this one is including which means that this whole thing includes if we look at both of them we do include zero so we don't even have to put a break there we just know that this is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity because every number is represented along our x value so when we talk about y our first y value is negative 10 and then we keep going up and here we have a stop but it doesn't matter because over here we don't and this one just keeps going up and up and up this graph over here becomes irrelevant because this is going up to infinity it doesn't matter what different portions of the graph are doing as long as some part of it is doing it that's all we care about and since this portion is going up to infinity then that we can just kind of ignore this part even though it's also going up to infinity so we're going to include the negative 10 because it's a continuous graph and then infinity gets a parenthesis now what about here well from the left the first thing we get is an infero going in the negative direction then we keep on going there's not a break here right because this is not including but this is and then we keep on going but it stops here and what's that x value here that's at x equals 4. it's a filled in circle so it gets a bracket in our negative infinity it gets a parenthesis now we're going to do the same thing with x i mean with y our domain we're going to come up and the first y value is one but look there's a gap so we have to that one is just one it doesn't have an interval it's literally only the number one so we're actually going to gap again so we're going to come over here and we're going to start again and say well this is at two and keep going up and it comes up to the x value of eight it includes two it includes eight now what happens if we have two separate intervals one although not an interval is a value we have to 
union them. So this is, let me write it out to the side. So it, one, and then we've got two, eight. These are two separate intervals, and we put a big U between them to denote that they are a union of one and the other. It's like basically that's the addition of intervals. Okay. Last one here. So we're going to start from the left. What's the first x value we come to? Negative 2. And it includes it, so we get a bracket. Then we're going to keep going. What's the farthest we get? We get here. But this is an arrow. Now, it's, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on here, but we assume that arrows like this uh, are going forever. And since this is continuing on, it's also continuing to the right. So we get an infinity. Now, since this is like this, we have to assume this. Be really careful. This is a poor graph because our arrow is way up here when it should be down here showing that it's continuing to go down. Because if I don't draw that and I start looking at my y values, the first y value I come to looks like it's going to be at negative 1. And then I'm going to come up to and the highest is going to be here at 4. But the problem is this graph over here actually goes down forever, which means our lowest point is actually a negative inferro, right? So be real careful when you look at these. Our highest point is still a 4, and it includes it since it's not, uh, not a hole. Now, if you've got any questions about any of this, please feel free to shoot me a remind uh, or raise your hand in class, send me an email.